Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a great series on preparation for the end time. Could that be our time? Well, this particular lesson is lesson number eight for May 26th of 2018, entitled, Worship the Creator. Hmm, that should be an interesting subject. Uh, as usual, we should begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have gathered here especially to try to understand more clearly how we can prepare for those final events in this world's history. We thank you for the privilege we have to share what we might be able to glean with those that are listening in. May each one be blessed according to your will is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. What is present truth? It's not yesterday's truth, right? The truth as we understand it today. Okay. Is it possible that, I mean, I, some people will tell you a well, truth is truth and it doesn't change. Is truth there? Truth doesn't change. It's our understanding of the truth that changes. Aha. Uh -huh. Perception. Yeah. Well, at one time, we Adventists printed a magazine entitled Present Truth. And it was an interesting one, very provocative one in those days. Well, as a church, we believe that God may at any time reveal additional new information. In fact, he probably does it on a pretty regular basis through people who study what's already there and people who receive new revelations. It's very important that uh, we, we, we keep up to date, date with the truth as is revealed. However, Contrary to the beliefs of some other churches whose names I won't mention, we believe that new truth never takes the place of old truth. The old truth is still valid, and the new truth has to be measured against the old truth. It doesn't, the new truth doesn't replace the old truth. You can't, say, say for example, uh, introduce a new day of worship. That doesn't work. Um, so the new truth doesn't take the place of the old truth. Well, from the time of the first gospel promise, as recorded in Genesis 3.15, our understanding of the gospel has increased. There was that first covenant or promise to Abraham, repeated to Isaac and Jacob, and later superseded by the second covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and repeated many times in the New Testament. There is no evidence that the writers of, this is an important point, think about this, there is no evidence that the writers of the Old Testament had any idea that, would, that there would be any more than one coming. They thought anything that was predicted about Christ's coming, that's going to happen the first time he shows up. They believed that all the prophecies of the Old Testament would be fulfilled at Christ's first coming. When we turn to the New Testament, we realize that none of the authors of the books in the New Testament had any idea about the millennium or a third coming until late in the 90s A.D. when God revealed that information to his friend John. It might seem strange to us to think that we have more truth, we have more access to more truth than Paul did. More truth than Matthew did, more truth than Luke did. We know things that were not yet revealed to humans in, in, in their day. Well, Seventh-day Adventists... we have even more truth than John? Yes, we absolutely do. Ellen White and more study of the Bible. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm sure we're going to find someday that he had, they had some truth that we don't have, but at least we know for sure that we have some truth that they didn't have. Ellen White says that uh, nobody, however privileged, has attained to a full understanding of oh, the sure. plan of salvation. Aren't you glad? I want to study the plan of salvation for the rest of eternity. Right. Well, from the beginning of our church history, we have believed that the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12 is our special message that we are to give to the world. I can remember when the standard expression for joining the Adventist church was to say, have you, ex have you accepted the third angel's message? That was just what, what, you know, what we, the way we said it. It, certainly be, it should be considered present truth. 
But in order to correctly represent those three messages to the world, we need to have a better understanding of the rest of Scripture, especially the Old Testament. I had a mentor who used to say, if you want to understand the book of Revelation, you have to start with the other 65 books. <laughs> you just have to have that background if you're really going to understand. There are, there are, some people have estimated that there are more than 2,000 references in the book of Revelation to the Old Testament alone. So, anyway, we're going to focus in this lesson on Revelation 14, 6, and 7, so let's jump over there right now and read that passage. This is the first, what we call the first angel's message. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news. So let's notice that it's eternal and that it's good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, honor God and praise his greatness for the time has come for him to be, for him to judge. Worship him who made he heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. And um, it turns out that the way that's actually stated in the original language, it could mean not only time for him to judge, it could be the time for him to be judged. It's an interesting idea. Well, look at some other parallel passages. Interestingly that enough, the Good News printed version says no. it's time to judge all people. Oh, really? But the electronic version takes out all people. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Judges more than people. Well, look at a couple other relative passages. Revelation, I'm sorry, Matthew 20, verse 14. And this good news about the kingdom will be preached to all the world for witness to how many people? All nations. And then the end will come. How good are we doing at reaching all nations? And then, of course, there's the passage that's quite familiar to many of us found in, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Let's just look at that really quick. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. So everybody everywhere, right? All peoples everywhere. That's a big challenge. Are we up to it? Well, these verses make it very clear that God has always intended, if, you, if we went back to the book of Hosea, we would find in the Old Testament, and back to the book of Genesis, we would find that it was God's plan for his good news to be spread to everyone. There was never a time when he thought, okay, it just needs to be you know, focused. Just Now, he focused on, say, for instance, the Jews in the Old Testament because... It, they were supposed to be spreading it to everyone around them, but they failed to do that. So are we ready to take up the challenge of presenting the message to all around us? Is that present truth for our day? Well, what about that? Galatians 3.22. Carrie, I think you have that. Yes. But the scripture says that the whole world is under the power of sin. And so the gift which is promised on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ is given to those who believe. And that comes from the Good News Translation of the American Bible Society. Okay, so if everybody has sinned, how many people need the good news? Everybody. 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 The fact that every human being is a sinner makes it absolutely essential that the remedy to sin be presented to each one. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> God is not happy to have any of his children die an eternal death. God's solution to the sin problem was sending his son to this earth to live and die as a human being. And you remember what Paul said about that. Romans 8, 3. What the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son who came with a nature like sinful human nature to do away with sin. That's what we want to do, right? Get rid of sin completely. Amen. Seventh-day Adventists have the most universal evangelistic program of any church. Why is that? Well, someone would say, well, but the Catholics are almost everywhere. Well, it turns out that the Catholic, is a fairly, Catholic church is quite divided. 
they don't try to administer all aspects of their church by for one central place. They have a, you know, there's a group that's over here and there's another group over there and whatever. So they're actually a group of churches. And then there's the World Council of Churches. Why don't we belong to the World Council of Churches? We are Seventh-day Adventists. They give you a spot to work and that's your spot only. The World, Cha World Council of Churches has said, we're all more or less equal, so you, this church, you work over there, and this church, you work over there, and this church, you work there, and someone else work back here. So they don't even try to reach the whole world. So there's only one church that I know of that's really trying, maybe not succeeding so well, but trying to reach the whole world. So why do we believe it is so important for us to share the gospel in addition, in addition to, to the help it might be to those who, to whom we speak? We know that trying to explain what one believes is one of the best ways to find out whether or not we really understand it. Just try it sometime. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I heard a clear explanation of why Jesus had to die. And I was so excited about it because I had been trained as a pastor up before that time and no one ever explained it to me in that in that way I tried to, a few hours later I tried to explain it to somebody else and I got about part way through and I couldn't remember what <laughs> what came next in the logical sequence it was pretty embarrassing okay so uh, we're going to take some examples about some things here about the good news uh, one, so, uh, one example that many people regard as maybe the good news is found in Luke 23, 32 to 43. And Jackie, I think that's yours. Mm. Mm. Two other men, both of them criminals, were also led out to be put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there, and the two criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Forgive them, Father, they don't know what they are doing. Oh, I shouldn't have taken this one. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> they divided his clothes among themselves by throwing dice. The people stood there watching while the Jewish leaders jeered at him. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah whom God has chosen. The soldiers also mocked him. They came up to him and offered him cheap wine and said, Save yourself if you are the king of the Jews. Above him were written these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other one, however, rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God? You received the same sentence he did. Ours, however, is only right because we are getting what we deserve for what we did. But he has done no wrong. And he said to Jesus, Remember me, Jesus, when you come as king. Jesus said to him, I promise you that today you will be in paradise with me. Now we have some problems with that last way, that last verse is translated. But um, that's the way many people understand it. Um, and Jackie, I want to say thank you very much for reading that with feeling. Ellen White had some very interesting things to say about that experience. Dennis, you want to take us to that? Uh, yes, this is from Desire of Ages 749. To Jesus, in his agony on the cross, there came one gleam of comfort. It was the prayer of the penitent thief. Both the men who were crucified with Jesus had at first railed upon him. The one under his suffering only became more desperate and defiant, but not so with his companion. This man was not a hardened criminal. He had been led astray by evil associations, but he was less guilty than many of those who stood beside the cross reviling the Savior. He had seen and heard Jesus and had been convicted by his teaching. Uh, but he had been turned away from him by the priests and rulers. Can I interrupt for just a second? How many of us are, are, hear something and we're convinced that it's true and we say, well, no, but the pastor doesn't really support that. The church doesn't support that. Why should I believe that? 
you know, my friends don't believe it, so well, I'll just put that aside. Yeah. Seeking to stifle conviction, he had plunged deeper and deeper into sin until he was arrested, tried, tried as a criminal, and condemned to die on the cross. In the judgment hall and on the way to Calvary, he had been in company with Jesus. He had heard Pilate declare, I find no fault in him, John 19.4. He had marked his godlike bearing, his pitying forgiveness of his tormentors. On the cross, he sees that many great religionists, stood, uh, religionists shoot out the tongue with scorn and ridicule the Lord Jesus. He sees the wagging heads. He hears the upbraiding speeches taken by uh, his companion in guilt. If thou be Christ, save yourself and us. Among the passers-by, he hears many defending Jesus. He hears them repeat his words and tell of his works. The conviction comes back to him that he is the Christ. Turning to his fellow criminal, he says, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art the same, uh, in the same condemnation? The dying thieves have no longer anything to fear from man, but upon one of them passes the conviction that there is God, a God to fear, a future to cause him to tremble. And now, all sin polluted as it is, his life history is about to close. And we indeed, and, and we indeed justify, he moans, oh, oh no, no, and we indeed justly, he moans, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. Desire of Ages 649. Wow. So here's, a, here's an example of someone, think of how many people in Palestine must have heard Jesus and, and struggled with, okay, are we going to follow the example of the teachings of the Pharisees and the, and, and the Sadducees and the scribes that we've heard all our lives, we're just buried in this teaching, and here's someone who comes up with some bright, new, completely different approach to so many things that, it seems attractive, but what do we do with all this stuff we've grown up with all our lives? And how many of us are stuck with that problem? Struggle with it even today. When we go to somebody, we try to say, look, read the Bible here. What does it say about the right day to worship? What does it say about the state of a man when he dies, etc.? And, oh, well, but I've always believed. And what do you say next? The story of the thief on the cross and Jesus' message to him is one that brings hope to many people. But why did Jesus speak those words to him? Jesus didn't say, I'm sorry, you had your chance when you learned about me previously. He didn't say, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5.20, New King James Version. Jesus did not mention the thief's past mistakes. He assured him right there on the cross that his sins, his crimes, his faults were forgiven. And thus, one day, he would be with Christ in paradise, Luke 23 and 43. Was that message to the dying thief on the cross the essence of the gospel? Well, many would say it is. God's forgiveness, isn't that marvelous? But forgiveness is not a guarantee of salvation. God is forgiveness personified. He forgave those who were nailing him to the cross even though they didn't ask him to. Verse 33. The real gospel, the real good news, is not that God forgives us when we ask him. It is the truth about God and his universal forgiveness. God never holds a grudge. But contrary to what many, excuse me, many people believe, forgiveness does not guarantee salvation. It is not God's unwillingness to forgive that keeps us out of heaven, but our unfitness to be there. If we choose Satan's side, the side of rebellion against God, we will become like him. And Gordon, I think you have some pretty startling words about that. Ellen White, Volume 4 of Spirit of Prophecy, page 486. It says, Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. 
His accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now silenced. The reproach which he has endeavored to cast upon Jehovah rests wholly upon himself. And now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. And of course, that's also found in Great Controversy, page 670. So this is talking about the time at the third coming, when the, the, the final truth is revealed in that great panorama in the sky, and even Satan himself is compelled to kneel down and say, God, you did it right. There's nothing more we could have asked that you didn't do. We do you did everything you possibly could to help every one of us. What an incredible revelation. So let's go back to our Revelation 14, and this time let's look at verse 7. What does it mean to fear God? And I have actually the King James Version there, just to get some of the traditional languages, language there. Fred? Yes, um, Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. It's interesting that if you go back to creation story, it talks about the heavens and the earth that God created. So why does John here add fountains of waters? Now we know that God made the fountains of waters as well, but why does he have to, have to I mean, why does he choose to mention them here? I don't think you bring it out later, but it's about the flood. The fountains of the deep opened up. And, uh, well, and what one of the, the first question, and we're going to get to that point in just a moment. The first question is, what does fear mean in, in, in the scriptures? Reverence, look, respect. Look awe. at a few passages. Look at Genesis 22, 12. Don't hurt. Now, this is God speaking to, to um, Abraham. Don't hurt the boy or do anything to him. He said, now I know that you honor and obey God. And the King James says, fear and honor, obey God because you have not kept back your only son from him. Now, did, uh, was, was Abraham showing how much he was afraid of God? Obviously not. Uh, look, valued. Look, at, look at immediately following the giving of the Ten Commandments. What happened to the Ten Commandments? Here's the mountain. And I have I've had the privilege of climbing that mountain, what we think is the right mountain, of climbing that mountain up there. You can see the top quite clearly from the bottom. It's not that high a mountain. It's a, it's a rocky hill, basically. And on the top of that mountain was God himself in a black cloud with lightning shooting out and a thumber, thunderous voice sounding. And the people are down there with their faces in the dirt, bowing down. Um, and what is... What is, what's the next thing that Moses says? When the people heard the thunder and the trumpet blast and saw the lightning and the smoking mountain, they trembled with fear and stood a long way off. They said to Moses, if you speak to us, we will listen, but we are afraid that if God speaks to us, we will die. Moses replied, don't be afraid. God has only come to test you. And in the, the King James it says, I should really read it from the King James. Let's just go there. Uh, hold on here. There we go. Coming to the right verse here. And I'm going to show you the Hebrew here as well as the... Um, Get to the right place if I can find the right verse here. Okay. Fear not, for God has come. Um, to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. Prove you and that his fear may be before your faces. Fear not so his so that his fear will be before you. That's kind of a crazy combination. Look at Job 1.9. Satan replied, would Job worship God if he got nothing out of it? Would, go, would Job fear God, it says in the more traditional translations. Ecclesiastes 12.13. After all this, there's only one thing to say. Fear God, or my modern translation says, have reverence for God and obey His commands, because this is all that 
human beings were created for. And then finally, Matthew 5, verse 16. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Okay? To fear God and give glory to Him. To many people, the fear of God is linked to obeying Him. Do we need to be afraid of God to obey Him? No. no. Really. What does it mean to be in awe of God? A-W-E? Admiring of God. Admiring of His message primarily. Okay. Respect and reverence. We need to recognize that we are fallen sinners. We deserve nothing but death. Do we recognize that each day as we realize the sinfulness of our, our actions, do we believe that God is just and righteous? What should a fear of God lead us to do? Well, there, there are people who believe that, um, excuse my language, you can scare the hell out of people. And that means you can scare them so bad that they'll go to heaven instead of going to hell. Is that possible? No. As the saying goes, he who is convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Yeah. So just because somebody points a gun at you and says, you know, do this, that, or the other, doesn't mean that you agree with doing this, that, or the other. As it said, you can't intimidate and persuade at the same time. Okay. It may, it may, you may be able to get somebody's attention for a short period of time, but in the grand scheme of things, yeah. long term, it all it does is produce the character of a rebel. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have to remember that in the pagan concepts of yeah. God, they all feared God. And God is basically saying, if you're going to fear God, make sure you fear the correct one. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good but point. It also says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. That doesn't mean the end goal. It's, yeah. it's a place to start. Yeah. And so I would say, in that context, maybe fear should take us to the foot of the cross. And that would be appropriate. And then we start to realize what God has actually done and all that he's done and all that it implies and all that it means for us. We should go beyond being afraid of God. And we should avoid fearing in the sense that uh, we, we are afraid of him. We should fear God because he has a truth. We should fear not to have that truth or <laughs> be fearful of not having the truth. Yeah. And going the other way towards yeah. death. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And perfect love <laughs> casts out fear. So yeah. the more we understand and come close to God, the less we will be have that human fear. I mean, you might uh, think of fear and pain somewhat analogy. Uh, in analogy, uh, is pain something God wants us to have? Well, in a sense, because He gave it to us to protect us. You know, so there. Uh, fear can be uh, a healthy thing yeah, if it recognizes that this, this is dangerous to, to go the other way. Yeah. Uh, let me just read the verse you made reference to, 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. So then love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid because fear has to do with punishment. So we need to recognize that, you know, while... Being afraid might get you started. It's not the final word. And as Jim points out often, if we're talking about salvation, the, the, word, the Greek word for salvation is sozo. Uh, what would we say? More like S-O-Z-O -O in, in, in English. And that word means not only salvation, it means healing. And fear isn't the way to get healed. Uh, it is only as we gain an appreciation for God and come to love, trust, honor, and respect Him that we begin to realize the real healing that is salvation. God wants us to be his friends, not just his trembling, fearful servants. Notice these words from Jesus himself. Jim? I do not call you servants any longer because the servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. I make mention that word that is translated into English as servants comes from the Greek word which means slave. Yeah. You're slave and we've been slaves to sin. Mm -hmm. He wants to offer healing. The other is, that's an example or a way Jesus is 
teaching. He says, everything I've heard from my Father, I've made known unto you. That's a teaching process. Mm -hmm. It's not a payment of a penalty process, yeah. which really does, that, that concept really is, does people a disservice. Yeah. So anyone who has an understanding of the plan of salvation and our future home in heaven will recognize that God cannot afford to admit anyone there who will disrupt the harmony of heaven and restart the great controversy. So God will conduct a pre-advent judgment, which is going on right now, we believe, to make sure that everyone is treated fairly but correctly. Is that why the first of the three angels' messages includes very specific instructions about a coming judgment? Does judgment ever sound like good news? If you get to notice that you have to appear before the judge, you get all excited about it, you rush in there, well, if you're innocent Christian and you Christians. believe that that justice will prevail, then that that clears the, it clears your name. Mm -hmm. If the judgment is rendered, if if you're, you're walking around with all these rumors and suspicions hanging over your head, uh, that's that's a fearful thing. But to go into the courtroom and have it all cleared up should be a good thing. My understanding that many times that where it's, it says judgment, it comes from the Greek word krisis, or, yes. which is crisis. It, it, crisis is where you make a decision. It's a decision time. It's not the some, and a decision is really on your part. Mm -hmm. Okay, not some external being that tells, tells you where you're going to head in. So I think it. That's something I've learned in the last couple of years. God's judgment can only be good news if we understand it correctly. How many people down through the ages have lived their entire lives scared to death of God? Yes. And there again, sullen submission produces the character of a rebel. People say, I don't want to, you know, it, it just... Yeah. It's a, a stress level that they're under, and they get more satisfaction in, in coping with life just by ignoring it. Well, let's, let's look at just a few verses that tell us exactly, at least fairly clearly, what happens in the judgment. Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 and Revelation 12, 10 tell us very clearly that the one who accuses us is who? Satan. Satan. Satan is the accuser. All three members of the Godhead are on our side. Let's just look at that really quickly. Romans 8, verse 26, In the same way the Spirit also comes to help us weak as we are, for we do not even know how to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us and groans that our words cannot express. And there's a lot of other good stuff, but I'm going to drop down to verse 31. In view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, now we said the Spirit is for us, God is for us, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own Son, but offered him for us all, he gave us his son. Will he not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will, be con will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus who died, or rather who was raised to life and is at the right hand side of God pleading with him for us. So who's pleading for us now? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're all on our side. And then Paul goes on to say, there's absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. Amen. Jesus himself and the Holy Spirit are pleading our cases in opposition to the statements of Satan. The Father is not the one who accuses us. It is only the devil who is accusing us. But the Father will make sure that everyone is treated fairly. So what happens in the judgment? Carrie, I think that's yours. Okay. And I saw the dead, great and small alike. Nope. The verse, the one before, one before that. that. One before? Oh, I marked the revelation. Okay, sorry. You can be sure that on Judgment Day, everyone will have to give an account of every useless word he has ever spoken. Your words will be used to judge you, to declare you either innocent or guilty. That's Matthew 12, 36 and 37. And Jackie, I think you have the next one. Important text. It says Carrie. That's mm. him. Did I? Oh, I see. You were going to do the math. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll go ahead and read this next one then. Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, 
as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead, death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged according to what they had done. So we are saved by faith, but we are judged by works. That's a conundrum that we sometimes really struggle with. Okay, if we recognize that God knows even the number of hairs on our heads, we certainly must recognize that he knows all about our secret thoughts and even motives. So it is true, the good news is to know that when we come to him in humble reverence and ask for forgiveness and healing, as Paul states, there is no condemnation, Romans 8, 1, anymore. Okay, who has the man cannot? Man cannot meet these charges himself. In his sin-stained garments, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea in behalf of all who by repentance and faith have committed the keeping of their souls to him. He pleads our cause and vanquishes our accuser, that's Satan, by the mighty arguments of Calvary. His perfect obedience to God's law, even unto the death of the cross, has given him all power in heaven and in earth, and he claims of his Father mercy and reconciliation for guilty man. That's Ellen White again, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 471. Just think how incredibly gracious and generous God has been in his dealings with us. How could we be anything other than generous and forgiving of those who have wronged us? Think about the, the people who were, the guy who was forgiven 50 pence and the other guy, or 50 denarii, and, and the other guy was given 500. And so what did he do? He goes out and tries to extract the penny from the person he loaned to in turn. If we can become partakers of the divine nature, which we can, if we can, become partakers of the divine nature, we will be like God who is forgiveness personified. And forgiveness will come automatically. It's been promised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, let's look at it again. What are the major points in the, well, let's go ahead and just read it once more because that's our main subject for today. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Okay, so what are the major points in those two verses? Well, I think creation yeah. is such a huge issue and wasn't until Darwin. Mm -hmm. And so it's a last day, very much a last day message. Yeah, it's part of the good news, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. On the other hand, we have to remember that we live in a day and age when science tends to worship nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what are we talking about? That's why the sources of water to me are the sources of the water of life. Mm -hmm. He's the one who's given us, he's the creator of all that, not just the physical, but the water of life. Okay. Clearly, God intends for this good news, including the creation, including the waters of life, is supposed to be for everyone. We've emphasized that, but we, want, we, don't, want to, we don't want to drop that point. It's very important. We need to share the message. And that's the, that's, we believe that's the message we've been given as a church, to share it to everyone. Then, honor, respect, and reverence God. Clearly, that's suggested. The time has come for God's judgment. And when we say God's judgment, is that God's judgment of us, or is it our judgment of God? <coughs> and the answer is yes. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Worship the creator of all things. And so, Jackie, I'm coming to your point. Maybe I should have put that first. Creation. The initial reason why we need to worship God is because he is our creator. But if God were the kind of person Satan has made him out to be, who would want to live with him? By recognizing God as our creator, first of all, we recognize our position as his creatures, seeking to be made in his image. By worshiping uh, God, I'm sorry, 
by worship God as our Creator again, we acknowledge our total dependence upon Him for everything, even life and breath. And there's a couple of passages that I, I, I love. They come from Paul's speech on Mars Hill, uh, Acts 17, 25. Nor does he need anything that we can supply by work, working for him, since it, it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. If we drop down to verse 28, as someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. So clearly, we're dependent upon him for everything. Another, and, another, and I brought this up before, but uh, you know, in regard to creation, uh, some try to blend. You know, it's mm -hmm. just that uh, evolution and God, and that God somehow brought us to this point through evolution. Yeah. But what kind of God would do it that way? Uh, would a God of love have brought? us to this point through sin, suffering, and death, and all of those kinds of things that we see in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, no. He, he spoke and it was so, and he commanded it. So we can go to Genesis and see that uh, everything was made good, and then there was the fall, and so forth and so on. So yeah. evolution just distorts that and uh, turns everything on its head. So. Yeah. Anyway, uh, second and third angel's message, Revelation 14, 8 through 11. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink of her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, Whoever worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on, his, on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury which he has poured out at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in its image, for everyone who has the mark of his name. Revelation, Good News Bible. Now, there's some pretty scary stuff in there. It's probably the most fierce language in the entire Bible. And we have declared that that's our message to the world. Are we supposed to be going out to scare people? Well, uh, we well, could... It depends on whether you stop the message there. It goes on here is the perseveration perseverance or patience of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So mm -hmm. you might have that as part of the message as well. Sure, yeah. Well, so let's just look at this really briefly. We don't have time to go back and explain the beasts and what they represent and why we to say that and so forth. What, what is the great Babylon? We're gonna leave that to you to look it up if, you, if you're very concerned about it. Babylon is a the, the the word Babylon, Babel, comes from a word that meant, meant the gate of the gods. So these people believed in a lot of different gods and so forth. Today we find people believing a lot of different things, which in essence is believing a lot of different gods. So God says, come out of all that confusion. Come to understand the truth as presented in the scriptures. It's simple, it's straightforward. You can understand it. And then there's that third angel. Um, and the first important thing we need to rec recognize about the third angel is that what God says here is specifically in response to what happened in the previous chapter, what Satan has said. And what did Satan say, Gordon? From Revelation 13 and 15 to 17, the second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark, that is, the beast name or the number that stands for the name. Okay, two or three things there that are really important to mention. 
the devil is determined to do what? Put to death all those who would not worship it. And the last part there, you can't buy or sell. Is he trying to, is he going to try to destroy all of us by starving us? Um, so God responds on the other side in the following chapter. Well, here's what's going to happen to the people who receive the mark. Satan says that if you don't receive my mark, I'm going to kill you. And God says, if you do receive the mark, you're going to perish. Uh, your God's wrath is going to pour out, pour out on you. That's pretty scary kind of stuff, isn't it? What do we do? It sounds like if you join this side, the other side's going to kill you. If you join that side, then this side's going to kill you, doesn't it? Well, you shouldn't fear those, as Jesus said, who, and I think you've got this coming up, the... Uh, uh, those who can f kill the body, but fear him who can destroy both body and hell, uh, soul and hell. Mm -hmm. So we should fear not those who are going to just, you know, just kill us, our bodies, but we should uh, try to respond. Oh. We should be fearful of not being in God's camp. We should be fearful of going our own way and, and following the uh, beast. Well, shouldn't we be afraid of people who can kill us? Doesn't sound like a nice thing to do, does it? But I'm not trying to knock your point. It, it's not the end, though. For us, it's okay. not the end. Yeah. And it that's like, the important point. And it was like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said God could deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship your, your image. Because we know that there's something beyond this life, don't we? No. Yeah. That's a really important. If the disciples in the upper room, I think of them in particular, what are they doing between Crucifixion Friday and Resurrection Sunday? They're scared to death behind locked doors in this upper room. What are they afraid of? They might lose their lives. Maybe the same thing will happen to them that happened to Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. A few weeks later, they come out and here's Peter saying, Jesus, whom you crucified, I just I have to, every time I have to laugh when I think about this, you know, he's standing in front of the Sanhedrin, the one, remember the lady had pointed his finger at Peter and said, I think, I think you might have been one of his disciples. Oh, no, not me, not me. And now look at him, he's standing and pointing his finger at the Sanhedrin and said, Jesus, whom you killed, what happened to Peter? Converted. Well, he recognized that there was something beyond this life. If he understood there was nothing beyond this life, if there was no resurrection, if he didn't know about what happened with Jesus, he would have still been running and hiding, right? Probably. So when you meet the risen Savior, you're, right. it makes a difference in your life. Absolutely. Well, we must know that the devil will be doing everything he possibly can to force as many as people as possible to respect him, reverence him, even worship him as the world's history comes to an end. He, that's what he has always wanted. I, we don't have time to go back to it now, but um, he's, uh, uh, um, what are the words I want, I want to say? Ezekiel? No, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. That's what Satan has always wanted. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to be thought of as God. But it's so important that we worship only the true God, right? So any serious Bible student should recognize the close link between Revelation 14, 7, which we just read, and Exodus 28, 20, verses 8 to 11. Let me just read that. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sea, the sky, and everything in them, but on the seventh day I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. But in, in Revelation 14, remember it talks about the heavens and the earth and the fountains of waters, uh, which we mentioned earlier. Why do you think it mentions the fountains of water? Is there something about the, special about fountains of water? Yeah, there is. We think it may apply to the flood. And think of how much the flood has modified what we see in our world today. So what about that? Do you think uh, 
we still should think of the three angels' messages as our message to the world? Or is this kind of old hat stuff? Oh. We have our logo built around it. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it's, it's now. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And the messages are pretty stark and pretty clear. You come out of the false churches, come away from those who are misleading you about what the Bible says and so forth. The time of judgment is coming. You know, stay away from people who have false ideas about how this world came about. All those messages are pretty, pretty clear. You, what about Satan's side? Is he, is he trying to scare people? Anything he can do. Anything he can do. Anything he can do to get them to join his side or to avoid God's side. Or make them numb. Yeah. yeah. Destroy them. We haven't m mentioned, we haven't had time to mention much about Daniel 7. And I guess I have a moment or two. Let's read a couple of verses from there. Daniel 7, 9 to 11. While I was looking, we're talking about God's judgment, Thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire. What's with all this fire? What does that represent? Nobody's sure? What happened on, the Mount, on Mount Sinai when he came down? Fire. Fire. This God's represents presence. God's glory. A stream of fire was pouring out from the throne. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. While I was looking, I could still hear the little horn bragging and boasting. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing the two sides lining up, right? As I watched, the fourth beast was killed, and his body was thrown into the flames, and so forth. And then during verse 13, during this vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being. He was... A human being in Hebrew, that would be a son of God. He was, approaching to me, he was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. He was given authority, honor, and royal power so that the people of all nations, races, and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever, and his kingdom would never end. And who is that? Who is that? There's only one person that could possibly take the, that, that title. Jesus. Jesus. has to be Jesus, exactly. <clears throat> so by carefully comparing the messages in Daniel 7 and 8 with the message in Revelation 13, it is very clear that the little horn and the second beast in Revelation 13 are the same power and represent the teachings and doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. It should be clear that the Roman Catholics believe that the Pope has usurped the role of God on this earth. Is that why we need to tell everyone to once again honor fear, and respect the only true God? Are we prepared to honor God and give glory to Him? The best way to give glory to God is to share His good, His good news with those around us. How many of the people that you associate with on a day-by-day -day basis really believe in creation? How many of them are not sure that God even exists? Our Bible study guide reminds us that the biblical concept of fear of God has nothing to do with superstitious feelings or with absurd ideas that we should serve God by being afraid of Him. So I was happy to see that in our Bible study guide, page 107, in the teacher's section, I might add. How does it make you feel to recognize that God can see every single one of your secret thoughts and motives? Does that scare you? By the way, when it's in the teacher's section, does that mean it's not good enough for the general population? No. <laughs> it, means, it means that they're saving a few things for the teachers to tell you that they didn't read already in their study guide. Okay. So, when God brings every work into judgment, what is it? He said, fear God, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. In, How? Uh, our Bible study over here at the church on Tuesday night, we're mm -hmm. starting Ecclesiastes. And oh. In preparation for that, I've been reading some things. And in one of the readings, there was an interesting comment, and that is that the book starts off essentially saying nothing matters, mm -hmm. but it ends saying everything matters <laughs> with what Good you point. just read. 
Yeah. And the process of going through the book, you go from one to the other. Look what Nehemiah says. We're running out of time, but I think we'll have time for this. Nehemiah chapter uh, verse six, uh, 9, verse 6. And then the people of Israel prayed this prayer. You, Lord, you alone are Lord. You made the heavens and the stars of the sky. You made land and sea and everything in them. You gave life to all. The heavenly powers bow down and worship you. So uh, Nehemiah suggested that we should worship God because he is the creator of all things. A similar sentiment is reflected by the 24 elders standing around the throne of God in heaven in Revelation 4.11. And then, I think, Carrie, is that you? Fred. No. Um, Fred, I'm sorry. Yeah. In her book, um, Great Controversy, Ellen White writes the following. The importance of the Sabbath as a memorial of creation is that it keeps every ever present the true reason why worship is due God. Yeah to God. Do we recognize every Sabbath all that we owe to God? Is he worthy of our worship? Well, Seventh-day Adventists believe that the Jewish annual festivals, especially the Day of Atonement, are a type of the history of our world. We don't have time in the minute or so that's left here to spell that out, but we believe just as there were certain events in the, in the history of the Jewish religious year, there are parallel events in the history of our world. Uh, and now we're down into the final days of what we call the Day of Atonement. Some have suggested that the addition to the expression, the springs of water in Revelation 14, 7, reminds us that a large part of why the world we now live in is the way it is because of the flood. Three days were allowed for the children of Israel to cleanse the camp, to m make their final sacrifices and, pre pre and prepare for the Day of Atonement. They were given very specific directions, I mean, even removing the yeast from your house. I don't know whether there's a big pile of yeast outside the, the camp or what they did with it, but they were supposed to remove anything that had any sign of, of any connection with sin, so they were prepared for that Day of Atonement. And through those ceremonies, at least in ritual, the sins were taken from into the sanctuary first and then from the sanctuary, put on the head of the scapegoat and taken as far away as possible. So this is a way of saying your sins are gone. So the children of Israel were supposed to prepare for that. We believe that that great final day of atonement began on October 22, 1844, and we challenge you to think about that. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying your word and trying to dig a little deeper and understanding, understand some of these things that are presented here. May we come to be like you through our study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.